The invisible force. The work doesn't really call this the invisible force, but as I was thinking about it, I thought there's this invisible force in life that is active, is working, but we don't see it. It's crucial that we become aware of it. Man is created to be a conscious being. The problem is that he's not conscious, but he's created to be conscious. That he's not conscious is not really the problem. The real problem is he thinks he's conscious. So man is created to be a conscious being. He's not conscious, but he thinks that he is conscious. He imagines that he is conscious. He believes with 100% of his being that he is actually conscious. So if you ask a man, are you conscious? He'll say, yes, I'm conscious. So his sense of I is completely immersed in this imagination that he is conscious. Yet there will be, in any given hour, hundreds of examples of his complete unconsciousness. He will not see any of them. And if he does see them, he'll almost immediately forget them. In other words, they will slip, those examples will slip back down into unconsciousness. And with all of this evidence, he still can't see that he's unconscious. So this bars the door to becoming conscious. If you think you have something, you're not going to attempt to acquire it. And you're certainly not going to put forth effort. If you think you have something, and it takes no effort, all you have to do is have somebody wheel you outside, and the sun falls on you, or the rain falls on you, and then you have it, well, then that's fine. We'll do that. But if it takes effort, forget it. We're not going to do it. This bars the door to becoming conscious. Since we're unconscious, we are governed by the swing of opposite events in life. Well, what does this mean, the swing of opposite events in life? All of life is made up of opposite events. Night, day, hot, cold, dry, wet, peace, war. The economy is good, bad. All of these things affect, severely impact your life. Well, what do you mean they impact my life? Well, if there's too much rain, it floods, and then your life is impacted. Well, if there's too much sun, it gets too hot, and then your life is impacted. Or if this happens, or if that's, or if there's too much rain, or if it's too cold, let's just say it's too cold, and there's a frost. What happens when you go to the grocery store? What happened with our recent frost? You go to the grocery store, produce, if it still exists, if we can get it at all, it's triple and quadruple the price because of the law of supply and demand. Well, what does that mean? That just means the opposites of the pendulum in life, the opposite events in life that are acting off of each other and causing these problems and affecting us. So we're governed by these opposite events in life. Newton's first law of motion is, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. This physical law has been recognized for hundreds of years, and it's been the basis of a lot of other studies and experiments and hypotheses and theories and postulations. The problem with Newton's first law is it leaves something out. It leaves out the invisible force. It only accounts for, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Then nothing happens. Everything is in stasis. If every action has an equal and opposite reaction, then nothing can move. So you see, Newton's first law really isn't the whole thing. And the problem with physics was that that was a great starter. It was a great primer. Newton's first law was a great primer. But it didn't go far enough. And the reason it didn't go far enough is because, as you can see, if every action has an equal and opposite reaction, then everything stays. And it's stasis. Nothing moves. Nothing can happen. Yet, you'll notice that we still think according to that law. We still act according to that law. Well, if I do this, he'll do that. Well, if I do this, they'll do that. So we're always thinking in these opposite terms. So we really are still living according to Newton's first law of motion, even though we realize now that that's not a complete law. It's not all there is to it. In fact, it's just not right. Einstein came along later, and he introduced time into physics to help it along. What that means is, if Newton had said, for every action, Eventually, there's an equal and opposite reaction. He would have introduced time into his law. By introducing time into his law, things then can change. So for every action, eventually, there's going to be an equal and opposite reaction. Now there can be some movement. But still, we don't know why. What is that? Time then becomes sort of like the third force, but it's not really. 
Einstein wouldn't have had to come up with the time thing had Newton really caught the whole law instead of just two-thirds of it. Quantum physics has now come along and it's taking this whole law thing even further. Why is that? What is quantum physics really trying to say? It's trying to say there's an invisible force. There's a something. There's a something in the universe that can do whatever it wants. That's really what quantum physics is saying. It's saying we now know that something, some thing, some one thing can exist in two places at the same time. What? We all know that can't happen. Yeah, quantum physics says no, it can and does. Now the time thing comes into it again. You know, these other dimensions. And now our brains start to hurt because we think in one, two, three, three dimensions. Okay, I'm a three-dimensional being. Now I can move. That puts me in the fourth dimension. Now I'm fourth dimensional. Quantum physics says, well, there's a fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth dimension. There are other dimensions as well. And we go, oh, wait a second. I can't understand that. And so that's why quantum physics is theory, because we can't really understand that. But it is taking things further. Ospensky said, people don't comprehend how they're governed by changing events, imagining that they're always free. Just raise your hand if you come into that category. Okay, I'm waiting for every hand to go up, because the hands that don't go up are the ones who are still sleeping. All right, good. So you can put your hands down now. And you people listening at home, can you, you can put your hands down too, because you look mighty silly there driving around in your truck with your hand up. <laughs> we imagine that we're free. We imagine that these events aren't really affecting us. Like somehow we've been Teflon coated and it just slides off of us, but it's not true. And we can see as we begin to observe it that it's not true. But we don't observe it. We automatically live through it, imagining this and imagining that. Gurdjieff said, everyone must bring third force into his life in order to develop. No one can develop, in other words, unless they bring third force into their life. Well, what is third force? Third force is invisible. We have this force here, the originating force, the active force. And we have over here the opposite force. So we know about Newton's first law of motion. For every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. So we have one force and then the opposing force. Easy enough. We have the active force, the passive force, but where is this third force? What does it come from? What does it do? What is it about? How do we employ it? What's it all about? The work says there are three forces, active, passive, and neutralizing. Newton's two forces plus the invisible one, which acts between the two visible forces. So we have the two visible forces of active and passive. But between those two forces, the work says there's a third force that acts between them. You say, well, well, what is that? Well, and this is why it's invisible. Well, what is that? It's difficult for us to comprehend it. It's the invisible force that works between the pendulum between yes and no, between active and passive, making something which is neither active nor passive, making something different. Okay, what? What does it make that's different? We may as well have the same object appearing in two different places now for us. Well, what does it make that we don't understand that? We can't get our minds around that very easily. Insurance companies use Newton's first law, which we can call the law of the pendulum in a, in a sense. In statistics, it's a good place for it. Insurance companies gather all the statistics, all the information that they can get. The more they can get, the better it is. They take all of the male drivers in the United States and they see how many accidents they've been in. And then they take the male drivers from 16 to 21 and they see how many accidents they've been in. And they take 21 to 25, see how many accidents they've been in. And they take 25 to 35, see how many accidents, and so on and so forth. And there's, there's a whole science of statistics. People do this. They just gather all this data and they look at it and manipulate it and check it all out. And, and then insurance companies employ that method to determine what's going to happen. You know that theoretically, according to statistics, if you take a coin and you flip it, say a thousand times, that eventually what's going to happen is there's going to be around 50% of the time it's going to be heads and around 50% of the time it's going to be tails that eventually that's going to happen. This is the exact same thing that insurance companies use. And it's really this law of the pendulum, this law of opposites. 
heads, it'll be heads, it'll be tails. And do you know, remember the one time we flipped the coin in the, in the Grange and it came in and, the, and it was yeah. flying through the air and it came down and landed on its edge and <laughs> stayed there. And it was like, oh, well, how many times has that happened? And we couldn't get anybody to answer us. <laughs> nobody would even, nobody would even bother answering that. Once like, that we can do it. Yeah, once that we know about. Out of how many? Well, I don't know. Yeah. I've never heard of it before. But I'm sure it can happen because it did. What is it in this whole thing that acts as the third force with the insurance companies? You can see that they've got this whole thing in statistics, the opposites. Well, what acts as the third force? Profit. What keeps them motivated to keep doing this? Profit. Profit is the third force that employs the two opposite forces so that a third thing comes out of it. They decided, okay, well, this is the way it is. Well, so fine, then we'll make this out of it. They applied a third force. Now, it was invisible. You can't see it, but they'd like to, on the bottom line anyway, if nowhere else. And so what happens is that the third force brings, with the insurance company brings this chaotic opposites that are at war with each other to a third thing, profit. They harness all of these statistics, all of these accidents, all of this stuff. They harness all this, and they bring a third force to work in it. And out of that, this third thing that comes up is profit, out of the chaos, out of just the opposites. Yeah, okay, so they're still going to have accidents, and they're still going to do this, and they're still going to do that. Yes, but if we charge these people more and these people less, because these people are going to collect more and these people are going to collect less, and the idea of insurance is that everybody puts something in so that when there's a disaster, whoever was hit the hardest is taken care of by everybody else. Now that's the idea. Of course, that idea can't work. And the reason it can't work is because of profit, greed, self-love. We think that's great, but if we don't give this guy so much and we don't give this guy so much and we collect more and more and more from these guys, we can have more for ourselves and then we'll have a pretty good business going here. That's not how insurance started out. Insurance started out as a tribal, as a family thing. When you think about it, people took care of each other. If something happened to somebody in the tribe, the rest of the tribe all pitched in. Everybody gave something to that person so that they could get back on their feet again. That's how insurance started. It started out of love and caring for the tribe. Or if you want to be like completely mechanical about it, you can say, well, they just did it out of survival. They knew if they lost one tribe member, then their tribe would be weakened, so they really did it out of self-love. Fine. Whatever makes you happy. You know, believe whatever makes you happy. It doesn't matter to me. The point is still the same. The point is, that's how the whole idea of insurance started. Work is a third force when it's acknowledged and felt. What that means is, this work, this system, is not a third force in a book on a shelf. That book has to be read. The truth in that has to be acknowledged, and that's not enough. It has to be felt. The person reading it and getting it, getting the knowledge, has to have some kind of emotional feeling about this. He has to have some kind of love for this. He has to say, wow, this is great. This is what I've been looking for. This helps to make things make sense for me. Unless that happens, the work doesn't act as a third force. It's just a book on a shelf. It's just nothing. His power is to make personality passive and essence active. So imagine, if you will, we have this board here, and I have written over here, false personality, and I've written over here essence. And over here, false personality has a big plus sign on it. And over here, essence has a big minus sign on it. The purpose of the work is to take these two opposites and change their signs so that the negative sign, the minus sign, is over here on the false personality, and the plus sign, the positive sign, is over here on essence. So that false personality becomes passive, changes signs, with essence, and essence becomes active. That's the object of the work. That is how the work acts as third force, to change the signs from positive to negative. Events in life are also a third force. So you've got the work, which is a third force, but you've got events in life, which are a third force. Which do you suppose is more powerful? It's definitely true that the events in life are predominant. So which is more powerful? Well, it's Definitely true that there are a lot more events in life than there is work, than there is ideas in this system. That's true. So actually, the events in life are more powerful. If they weren't, there wouldn't be really much effort necessary, would there, in the work? We wouldn't really have to make much effort. We'd just choose. Well, I choose the work. Well, that would be my third force. Oh, that'd be great, wouldn't it? It's just that it doesn't work that way. The problem is that the events in life grind. 
and they keep coming at you, and they keep clawing, and they keep digging, and they keep tearing, and they keep pulling. And the work just sits there on the shelf, waiting for you to acknowledge it, and to have some feeling about it, and to apply it with effort. There's no effort involved in the events in life. They're going on within you, without you, with you, or without you. We were talking about death last night. And Connie said she was at somebody's funeral. She came out of the funeral home, and here's life. People are at the mall shopping, and she said to herself, Wow, look at this. Bobby's dead, and all these people are shopping. And it struck her see, that it didn't change a thing. This person's death didn't change a thing. That's how it is in life. The events in life go on. Nothing changes them. Oh, no, but, but a really good person does. No. Oh, but a really bad person does. No. They are just part of the events. See, in this system, you are either out of the world or you're in the world and a part of it. You're just a cog. You're just part of the wheel. You're just part of the organic film on this planet being acted upon by some forces outside of this planet and acted upon by forces in this planet, on this planet, and that's it. You don't have any choices about that, or you have very few choices about that. You have a choice whether you're going to lift your right arm or <coughs> lift your left arm. And you don't really have a choice about that. When you think, well, raise your hand. Well, which hand are you going to raise? You're going to raise your dominant hand. Well, why is that? Because you don't have any choice. That's why. Now, that you're conscious about it for a moment, you could raise your other hand. You could raise the hand that's not dominant. That is possible. But it's very unlikely that you could do that every time, because you'd have to be awake. And we aren't. We just imagine that we are, which brings us right back to where we started. So we have the work as a third force, and we have the events in life as a third force, keeping personality active and essence passive. Life, the events in life as third force, keeps personality in the plus side and keeps essence in the minus side. The work turns that around, puts essence in the plus side, and false personality in the minus side. So now we've got that. On the work point of view, a man who is based solely on the evidence of the senses has his brain wrong. He's wired wrong. From a work point of view, from a worldly point of view, from a life events point of view, that guy makes perfect sense. But from a work point of view, he's wired wrong. He needs to be rewired. He needs the plus sign and the minus sign switched. He is cross-wired, miswired. But from a life point of view, he's wired just perfectly fine. That's just the way we should all be. The work acknowledges the spirit of life as the third force which reconciles the antagonistic pendulum forces so that something can happen. So we know that with Newton's first law of motion, we have for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction, which means stasis. Nothing's happening. What the work says is, but there's a third force that's active, and it's in the spirit of life. It's invisible, because it's a spirit, just like a team spirit is invisible, really. You can't put it in a jar. You can't market it. It's real. It's there. You can see if your team is down or if your team is up, if they're ready to win or if they're ready to lose. You can see if they have the camaraderie that they need to get along and work as a team or if they haven't. So it's all part of team spirit, yes? Okay, so it's invisible, but it's real. You can't feel it. I mean, you can't see it. You can feel it, but you have to feel it in some other way. So we're talking about a different kind of feeling other than sensation feeling. You can't touch it, but you can feel it. So the work acknowledges this is the spirit of life as the third force reconciling the antagonistic pendulum forces so that something can happen. The work basically says that the soul is the vehicle for this organizing principle, this spirit of life that's in man. But it also says pretty much... Now, the work doesn't really say this itself so much, but I'm going to say this because it's true. What happens is the soul, which is the vessel for this organizing principle, this spirit of life, this third force, this invisible third force, the soul is the vehicle for that. It's the container for that. But as the soul comes down and enters into the body, as it enters into the material realm, it's nearly devoured by the material realm. You understand what I'm saying? It's severely weakened. It's eaten up. A lot like, if you look at it this way, a lot like when a vehicle, a space vehicle, is coming back into the Earth's atmosphere, or an asteroid is coming into the Earth's atmosphere. What happens to it? Pretty much it's devoured coming into the atmosphere, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Very few actually make it through the atmosphere to the Earth. Asteroids, that is. Well, why is that? Well, because they burn up. 
You see, souls are like that too. A lot of the soul burns up coming into this environment, this body, this physical environment, descending into the body. So the work calls this invisible organizing principle buried conscience or real conscience. So this invisible third force, this organizing principle that makes it possible for something to break the deadlock between the opposites, the equal opposite reactions. The work calls this conscience, buried conscience, real conscience. The organizing power in creation permeates everything that's seeking to build something different from what houses it. So this spirit of life, let's call it, this third force, this spirit of life, this organizing principle, it's in everything. It's in everything, but it's constantly trying to break out of it. So what does this mean? Well, it means it's a third force that's very necessary because it now has something moving in here where the two are just deadlocked, where the active force and the passive force are neutralized, essentially. They're stuck. They're deadlocked. But the third force comes in and it gives motion. It gives something can happen now. So that's why the work says, unless there are three forces, nothing happens. Everything's just potential. In us, there are finer matters being freed from heavier, more chaotic matters. So here we are. In us, this third force as the work acts as something that tries to free us from the heavier matters, from the coarse matters, and lift us into finer matters, the lighter matters, okay, and the higher matters, into material that is more sublime, finer. Okay, so it's trying to raise us up out of what false personality would enslave us in, which is just this mechanical over and over again, basically pendulum swing. Yes, no, up, down, hot, cold, in, out. And the work seeks to break us free of that. So it is the force that if we apply it by acknowledging it and by having some feeling about it, that it supplants the events in life as being third force and gives us the opportunity to develop. This is what Gurdjieff's point was. And so there you have it, which is a pretty neat trick when you think about it. This third force, this organizing power, is seeking new and better combinations and relations between the active and passive forces that constitute matter. So we're talking about matter, all matter now, that this third force is in all matter. So now you look at it like, well, wait a second, so that means that there's a force in matter that's constantly trying to break out of matter? Yes. Yes, it's constantly trying to evolve matter. It's constantly trying to lift matter up. It's constantly trying to make it finer. Now that is an idea. That's an interesting concept, isn't it? There's something in all of matter that's trying to lift matter higher. This would account for evolution at a cellular level, at an atomic level. This would account for evolution. See, the problem with Darwin's whole theory of evolution is it was like Newton's first law of motion. It wasn't all there, just not all there. He could only see what he could see. He couldn't see the invisible force. Because he couldn't see the invisible force, he couldn't take it into account. Without taking it into account, you end up with craziness. I mean, let's face it, Darwin's theory of evolution is pretty crazy. There are a lot of pretty crazy ideas out there. Organizing spirit, third force, buried in the material, chaos, working to free itself. That's really what we're talking about. We're talking about this organizing third force, this spirit of life, that's buried in the chaotic material matter realm, material realm, and it's constantly working to free itself, to lift itself up, to make things finer, make them lighter, not so heavy. Spirit is real and invisible. You've been given this spirit. How do I know that? Because it's in all matter, and you have matter. You have material bodies. And you have finer and finer material bodies. You don't just have one material body. you got the one material body here I can put my hands on. But inside of that material body, there's a finer body. There's the air, for one thing. There's the fluid that's going through your body. What, 90-some percent of your body is fluid? So there's the fluid going through that material body. Then inside of that, there's air going through that material body. So then you've got three bodies right there. You've got your skeletal system, okay, which is denser. Then you've got the fluids. Then you've got the air. So you've got these three bodies contained in this one body. Then you also have a feeling body, an emotional body. Then you also have a mental body. You have a thought body that's right in there. too. You have an idea of what your body looks like. You don't see your body for a long time. You'll still have an idea of what it looks like, who you are in a physical sense. 
You recognize yourself when you look in the mirror. People look in the mirror and they go, oh, I know who that is. I mean, they don't even think twice about it. If you looked in the mirror and saw me, you'd be freaked out. Because it wouldn't fit your picture of your body, you see. That's what I mean. We've got these bodies. Now the question is, you've got this spirit. You've been given this spirit. What will you do with it? You can leave it in its earthen vessel. You can leave it buried in the ground, because that's really what it is. So you've got this spirit that's reaching higher. It's trying to reach finer, higher influences all the time, all the time, just by the very nature that it exists as third force. It is striving for that. So you've got that in you. Now, the question is, what part do I have to play in this? Well, let's look at the parable of the talents, the one that Jesus told. So here, the master comes along and he gives his servants these talents. He gives one guy this many, and one guy this many, and one guy this many. And then he goes away. And he comes back, and he finds the one he'd given so many talents to, he went out and he did a lot more with it and got more talents. And he gave them that back. He said, well, here they are. Here's the ones you gave me and the ones I burned. He said, wow, good job. So here's the next one. He'd given a few less. And he says, well, what did you do? And he said, well, here's the ones you gave me, and here's a few more that I earned. He said, wow, good job. He goes to the guy he only gave one talent to. And he said, well, what do you got? And he said, well, here's the very talent you gave me. I knew that you were really hard and difficult, so I went and I buried it in the ground. And then when I heard you were coming back, I dug it up, and here's your very talent. He said, well, you idiot, I could have put it in the bank and got interest. So get out of here. Took the talent away from him and gave it to the guy who had the most. What is this really saying? It's saying that this talent that we're all given is really nothing more than this spirit, this organizing principle, the spirit of life, this invisible third force that we've been given. And we either use it, employ it, assist it in reaching up to reach higher influences and finer matters. Or we bury it in the earth. We bury it into material things. We bury it in false personality. So your choice is, are you going to bury life and your potential in false personality? Or are you going to change the positive sign to a minus sign on false personality and begin to develop something more, which we'll call essence at this point? That's the question for us. If you will, then it's the talent in the parable. The man who took his spirit and put it in the earth didn't do so well. The man who took his spirit and let it fly, let it work, employed it properly. And those two guys did very well. And the more effort was put forth, the better he did.